Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Threadbear Reviews. Well, we're getting to the last DLC of The Witcher 3 now, and while it's a long expansion, I should probably get to reviewing the last two books of the Sapkowski series before the game wraps up completely. As such, today we'll be taking a look at the sixth book and fourth novel, The Tower of Swallows. As usual, we'll jump straight into... The Review. A lot of things happen to a lot of people in this novel, and not only do we keep switching perspectives, we also keep switching time frames. So, for the summary, I'll be simplifying things by describing each character's plotline in turn. Geralt continues his journey to find Ciri, and he determines that his best bet is to find a circle of druids who live near the Yoruga River. However, the druids keep moving around as they attempt to flee the war, and ultimately he has to cross into Nilfgaard and enter the Duchy of Toussaint, a relatively independent domain and fairy tale kingdom according to its neighbors. Along the way, Geralt learns of a waiting ambush thanks to a former bandit named Angolem, who joins them, and while Geralt at first blames Cahir for ratting them out, he eventually decides it must have been Yennefer who betrayed him. But he turns out to be wrong on both counts, because Vilgefortz is the one who wants to kill him. However, the ambush is itself ambushed by a group of freedom fighters, and in the end, Geralt saves a knight errant from Toussaint, and is saved in turn by the druids, who were also being targeted by the bandits. Meanwhile, Ciri's life with the rats is cut short when the bounty hunter Bonhart kills them all in single battle. However, he spares Ciri's life because he recognizes her sword techniques as belonging to the Witcher School of the Wolf, and so he decides to put her on display by forcing her to engage in pit fights. However, when Stefan Skellen and Reince, the servant of Vilgefort, start sniffing around, he takes Ciri to them to negotiate. The three men come to a deal, but then Ciri breaks loose, and when a psychic tries to probe her, she also gets her magic back. She escapes when the Wild Hunt intervenes, recovers for about a month in a swamp with a hermit, and then flees to the Tower of Swallows, where a portal lets her escape into a dimension ruled by elves. For her part, Yennefer escaped the Lodge of the Sorceresses at the end of the last book, and she spends this one planning her next move in the Skellige Isles. Ultimately, she decides to become bait. She allows Vilgeforts to capture her, and she hopes that the magic released by their battle will allow others to track down his hidden lair. And that's about it. So the first thing I'll say about this book is that it's a lot like Blood of Elves, in that it's a transitional novel. It's not really about getting things done in these pages, so much as it's getting people to where they need to be for the next novel. There's no real climax in which the protagonists succeed, just a bunch of smaller stories in which the antagonists fail. Still, by this point, it's clear Sapkowski has learned how to write a novel, and so I'd rate The Tower of Swallows above Blood of Elves, but below both Baptism of Fire and The Time of Contempt. Something else I should mention about this novel is that Sapkowski seems to have used it to experiment with non-linear storytelling. Not only does the novel tell its story fragments out of chronological order, it also uses several overlapping framing devices as various individuals tell parts of the story to other characters. Ciri talks about Bonhart, the Swamp Hermit, the psychic in Skellen's band is a witness in a trial a year later, Dandelion starts writing his memoirs, and at one point we take a break from everyone else so that Dijkstra can contemplate the entire history of the Kingdom of Kavir while he visits its king. Oh, and then the king's grandson describes the visit 70 years later. The reason I call this an experiment is first, because Sapkowski has never really done nonlinear storytelling before, and second, because a lot of the asides and framing narratives are completely pointless. I fully understand that the author was adding a certain historical theme by using these methods, but he still uses more asides than he needs to, and as a result, the narrative is unnecessarily tangled. On the other hand, one positive thing I will say about the nonlinear story is that, despite how tangled everything got, I was never confused about what was happening or when. For the most part, each sub-story is told chronologically, and in addition, the story keeps reminding us of important holidays like the autumnal equinox and the last day of October. 
This gives the readers landmarks they can use to figure out where on the timeline any given substory is. Ultimately, The Tower of Swallows is not my favorite Witcher book, but it is a necessary part of the larger story. I've already told you how I'd rate it against the previous novels, so let's move on to the next section. The Analysis The big theme of this book, and the reason it has so many asides and framing devices, is the interaction between the individual and the historical record. Each protagonist is in the middle of events that will shape the future forever, either politically because of the ongoing war, or culturally because their story will become a legend told to future generations. Ciri is a nexus point, a chosen one, someone marked from birth to do great things, whether she likes it or not. Because of this, everyone wants Ciri, although why they want her depends on the faction. The Lodge of Sorceresses wants her to marry the Prince of Kavir and create a northern empire that can keep Nilfgaard in check. The Emperor of Nilfgaard wants to marry her to secure Sintra's loyalty, and also because of a prophecy that says her children will one day rule the known world. Stefan Skellen wants to kill Ciri to disrupt the Nilfgaardian Empire and hopefully install a democracy, although considering who he works with, he's more of an Oliver Cromwell than he is a Thomas Jefferson. Bonhart wants Ciri because he's a sadist and he enjoys watching her kill people on demand. Vilgefortz wants Ciri because her unusual genes are perfect for experimentation. And finally, Geralt wants to rescue Ciri because she is his child of surprise and he is her father figure. But instead of zooming in on all of these people and all that they want, Sepkowski has deliberately chosen to widen the focus, to view this moment in time from a historical perspective, and not just a personal one. This lets us see not just each moment as it happens, but also the effects those moments have on the future. Dandelion starts writing his memoirs, but when he dies unexpectedly in the future, his manuscript gets uncovered by archaeologists and then burned by a couple of illiterate hired hands. The psychic discovers halfway into the hut that Skellen is planning treason, and so she ends up being a witness and a suspect at Skellen's trial. The King of Kavir sends a bunch of unwanted troublemakers as mercenaries to help Redania, and later on, they become famous warriors. We also see this focus on history in other ways. The elven sage Avalok makes his first appearance in this book, and when Geralt meets him, he's painting a fake Neolithic mural on a cave wall and he's doing this to distract humans from the elven ruins hidden behind the wall. It's a good illustration of the duality of history, the way it mingles fact and fiction, and tends to prefer things like confirmation bias and storytelling over things like truth and honesty. And yet, at the same time, we also see the way individual actions can swing the course of history, no matter who ends up writing the record later. Three powerful men plan out how to use and dispose of Ciri, but she ends up escaping them because one of Skellen's posse accidentally gives her back her magic. The assassination of Geralt almost succeeds, but an attack by an unrelated group of freedom fighters gives him a chance to fight back. And the only reason Yennefer decides to sacrifice herself so that other people can track down Vilgefortz is because she put her faith, for the first time ever, in a goddess, and the only reason a priestess encouraged her to do so is because Yennefer helped stabilize a pregnant woman who just happened to faint while standing next to her. Little actions and little people can make a big difference, even if it never seems like it in the moment. Thanks for joining me again for today's Threadbare Review, and I hope I'll see you next time. Until then, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and if you have a little extra money to spare, you can support me on Patreon. Link in the description.